since Sally spoke so much about him. Andy Williams is our guest, and uh, he fills in a little bit more information about uh, the personal side of Medicine Man. He uh, tells us a a bunch about his uh, upbringing and and what made him uh, perfect uh, to uh, to go ahead and run that business and, and have as much success as they're having. Okay. All right. So it's uh, Andy Williams time. Okay. Andy, welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Seth. So, uh, I mean, Medicine Man. You know, we've we've had Sally on, as you know, mm-hmm. and uh, we're we're gonna hope to have Pete on uh, <laughs> w- when we get to Denver. And and Sally has said I, I she would like to be present oh. for the Pete interview. No, no, she insisted. I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, why why singular? Why why Medicine Man? Well, all right, this is all my brother. Yeah. Um, when he, let's see, he, he was a caregiver prior to Medicine Man forming. Right. And during that time, he's, he's a mad inventor, Sally probably told you that. Mm-hmm. And um, he invented a new bong, and uh, he named it Medicine Man. And, ah. and he loved that bong. And, uh, and so when we were forming the company, I said, okay, let's think of a name now. Right. And, um, you know, I, I had all these stupid names in my head whatever right and uh and he said medicine man and he wouldn't brook any argument he <laughs> he was it is medicine man and uh i said okay and you know he wanted a different logo <laughs> so i got to do that right okay <laughs> but um but yeah he wouldn't brook any other name and i you know it's again i don't know if sally told you but we have had you know, we did a lot of great planning a lot of great execution right. but boy have we had a lot of luck too in our success she did mention luck yeah and um and that was just another one of those small little luck things that i think i think we hit on a good name yeah no yeah. it it stuck tell us you said i had a couple other names uh flying around the head do you remember any of them you know i don't remember i don't remember any of the names what i do remember is logos because yeah. i spent a lot of time thinking about logo right. and um and I had to actually hire someone to come up with a good idea because mine were all bad. Like mine was a hand, but I think that was already taken. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, my brother had uh, an Indian medicine man dancing around, like you might see in the stores or whatever. Right. And they were all bad ideas. And and uh, we actually hired a uh, a graphic artist student, and I think we paid him fifty bucks. And um, and he came up with the medicine man logo and that, with some direction from us, but pretty much all him. Well, because it, it looks like a flower. It does. It looks like a tulip. I right. just love it. Yeah. And uh, and it looks a little tribal. It looks there's a lot of looks to it. Right. And yeah. yet it's uh, simple all all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy to put on a shirt. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Um, you you have it on your shirt right now, even. I do. <laughs> I sport a lot of a lot of gear. Even my daughter sports medicine man gear. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Your daughter, anything else or just the one? I have a daughter and a son, ten right. and four. Right. And uh, love them to death. Got it. Good. And uh, we want to get to to how you have kids. Um, but, uh, you know, pretty much the usual way. Yeah, exactly. I, I think Andy Joseph, uh, who we, we interviewed said, uh, he has, uh, five kids, I think wow. uh, four or five. And, uh, he said, I, we, we finally figured out how that happens. <laughs> <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Yeah, exactly. So he, he thinks he's done now Good. because he's figured it out in retrospect. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Um, but Sally, you know, speaking of, of kids and childhood, mm-hmm. Sally kind of brought us through your nomadic uh, history <laughs> yeah. with Mama Michelle, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, who I told her I've met, and as you know, I've, I've yeah. met. So, I mean, you know, we, we've got one take on it, mm-hmm. you know, but Sally's the oldest, right? So mm-hmm. what was your take on kind of, were, were you in Japan or, or did you miss that part? I was in Japan for uh-huh. a little while because we had gone back um, again after you know, Sally was born. Right. And I, I remember a little bit of it, quite honestly, which is really strange for me because I have a terrible memory. Right. Um, but I do have some memory of Japan, um, but very little. To me, it was just America, you know, because it, it was on a base and, and I was with my mom and my dad and my right. sister. And, you know, right. So. And then what, what parts do you remember? We know that you obviously settled in uh, Colorado. Mm-hmm. Do you remember Florida? Do you remember New York? Do you remember California? Yeah, California. I, I remember, I remember, you know, small memories from california like going to disneyland or whatever cool yeah but i don't remember the house i don't remember a lot of friends i my memory picks up in new york at the trailer park right when my brother tried to 
burn down a forest. Oh, she didn't tell us that story. Oh, she didn't. No. Oh. So we're going to need that okay, right now. Yeah, yeah, very good. So we lived in a trailer park in, uh, in New York, upstate New York, yeah. and Dunkirk, and uh, right near there. And my brother and I you know, had really nothing to do all day except to go out and play with other people or go in the woods that are nearby and um, whatever. And, and so we were out there. We got a book of matches, and I was having fun teaching my little brother how to light matches. Yeah. And you know, my memory does put the blame directly on Pete. Whether right. Whether it happened that way or not, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you just said it to me right now. You yeah, said yeah. my brother did. Yeah, because right, yeah, yeah. that's, that's my memory. But, you know, I, I, I do realize that my memory will play tricks on me but uh fair enough yeah and uh and anyway i just remember him and, uh, and me stacking up a bunch of sticks and lighting it and just kind of standing back and you know in wonder at our power to make this fire <laughs> and uh it quickly spread <laughs> we didn't know what to do so we probably just watched it <laughs> and soon enough the fire engines arrived without causing too much damage and put it out for us but uh, well that's nice yeah yeah how how old were you guys at the time I was six, I think, which meant he was four. Okay. And, uh, and you, you're describing it as though you are mini cavemen, you know. That's about what we were, you know. Um, <laughs> like, first, fire good, <laughs> and then the Frankenstein, fire bad. That's right. That's kind of what we were. But my mom had a, a unique uh, method of raising kids, which was let the kids do trial and error. And, um, and, and I loved it. You know, we had a lot of freedom. We could go all over the trailer park. This is before the days where everybody thought kids would be kidnapped and and bad things happened right and uh and so we just have the run of the land and we were able to make lots of mistakes and learn over time and i've continued that throughout my life right you know we and you mentioned luck and we're going to kind of come back Mm -hmm. to that but let's talk about a few of these mistakes so we've got forest fire number one right (laughs) (laughs) what what you know what else comes to mind when I, I, these are lessons learned is another way to say mistakes, right? So what, what, what would be another one from, from childhood? Oh, geez. There's so many. Um, <laughs> they're all simple, though. I never yeah. had anything too dangerous. You know, swimming too far out in the ocean, almost drowning. Right. Um, I was lucky a passerby came by and, and hauled my butt back in. Right. Um, I, I didn't realize how close I came to drowning. You know, later in life, you think, wow, I was really far out. I was dead tired. I was about to go under, and that guy happened to swim by. Just happened to be there. And, and yanked me out. Yeah. And uh, I didn't care at the time. I was like, eh, all right, I made it. Um, <laughs> what are some of the others? I, oh, <laughs> Pete, like I said, is a man inventor. And yeah. so he would get BB gun uh, cartridges, uh, CO2 cartridges. And he, had, he made a little process where he'd mix some magnesium, some gunpowder, and and of course, he'd have to take bullets apart to do that, and and drill a little bit bigger hole in the, in the tip of the CO2 cartridge. And he made a funnel that he can put like one grain of powder at a time down in there. And he would painstakingly pack this cartridge full of gunpowder and put a fuse in. And uh, so he made a, a few of them, and we took them out, and we'd set up boards, and and we would look to see what the shrapnel pattern was, and. And I mean, these were deadly. These were just bombs. <laughs> and, and so we'd blow up. I remember what the, this cop came rolling up after we had just set off the third one, which was our last one. And he said, all right, boys, give me the fireworks. Right. And he said, oh, we just used our last one. Right. Said, Sorry oh, about yeah. that. Yeah. Said, okay, boys, don't do that again. Yeah. yeah. And I'm uh, sure that he would have been surprised to learn that, uh, well, no, no, these were homemade. Yeah, we know we didn't say a word. No, exactly. Yeah. They're, oh, they're gone. Yeah, they're gone. Oh well, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, we. You know, we had a gun in our room since I can't remember how old we were. I was probably I was twelve. He was ten. Mm-hmm. I don't know how early we started, but uh, we slept in the in the basement of the house that we were in at the time, and we we made a gun rack because there was lots of construction material all around us. It was a new new neighborhood, right? And. Uh, and we made a gun rack, and we had a loaded twenty-two in our room between us. I, and I, I think back, and today a mother would be put in jail for doing something like that, almost. And uh, but we were, you know, we were shooting all the time as little kids. Well, and, and in defense of Michelle, if I may, yeah, uh, she was working all the time. Oh, I'm not, I'm not calling my mom out. I loved it. I right. thought it was great. Right. No, and and it and it made us who we were. Right. Know? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
So, you know, what? what's your take, though, on the fact that one, two jobs, however many jobs to kind of get it done? What's your job on uh, what's your take on, you know, her just keeping busy to just get it done? You know, that was an amazing thing. And I appreciate it even as a little kid. Um, I remember we were in New York and um, and this was our routine. We'd wake up in the morning. Mom was there. She'd get us ready to go to school. We'd run off to school come home and and um, we'd start playing with our friends out in the street because you know back then you didn't have TV on all the time because there was only news on until certain times of the day right and so we'd be out playing and mama calls in at 4 30 to eat dinner and it used to piss me off because I'd be like no one else eats till six <laughs> why are we eating at 4 30 right and um, and but I know why she had to go to work right and so we'd eat dinner and and um, off she'd go to work, and uh, we had the neighbor teenage girl come over and babysit periodically, and, and she'd stay with us till we fell asleep. But anyway, we would go back out and play, and then when we'd come back in, and the teenager would stay until we fell asleep, and she would leave. So we'd be home all night, you know, just sleeping by ourselves. Right. And uh, mom would get home in the wee hours. She had a sewing job. She worked at a sewing factory. And um, and the day would start over for her. She'd get us up, get out of bed, go off to and. And that was a routine, and and I remember, you know, we didn't. I knew we didn't have any money, and mm. neighbors would bring over food and things like that. And and I remember sitting there thinking, oh, I've got to run away. I've got to stop being an expense for my mom, you know. Right. And and uh, so I would tell my mom, I'm gonna run away, <laughs> and and she would be very serious and say, okay, Andy, well, where are you gonna go? And I don't know what I'd tell her, you know. And 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 so she would help me pack a hobo bag. And if you know what I mean, a stick and a yeah. bandana with right. some food in it. Yeah. And, uh, and she's, well, I'm going to miss you. You know, see you later. <laughs> and, and I'd start walking down the street. Reality would hit me. I'd turn around, go back, try bawling. <laughs> <laughs> but mom did that for the longest time. And um, it, it blows my mind how she did it. I really don't. And it's not to say that my dad was a deadbeat dad. He, he was in the military and center child support um, but you know back then it wasn't a lot of money right and um, so she had to do a lot to to get by yeah and that's such an interesting thing that she would actually let you run away yeah you know <laughs> she would okay fly bird yeah. fly yeah and then uh, what what is the lesson now sitting you know now you're an adult yeah wh- how, how do you read that like what 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 do you think that taught you in retrospect you know, she always taught us to think for ourselves, and um, and she gave us freedom that that very few, I think, parents give their children uh-huh. and, to fail. And and it's an it's a wonderful time to fail when you're a child. Um, this is very, you know, I mean, the consequences can be dire, but mm-hmm. for the most part, they're not bad. Right, stakes are a little bit lower. Yeah, if you're ten. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so she allowed us to fail and to learn how to fail, to learn how to rebound from it. Right. And uh, and move on. And, you know, I think a lot about how the heck did she raise four entrepreneurs? Because she's not an entrepreneur. Um, you know, she's a great nurse. You know, she's a caring person. And all these great attributes, but not an entrepreneur. And yet she raised four of them. Right. And that has a lot to do with it, I think. And you guys all work together now, right? We Baby do. sister, the bud tender. Yeah. <laughs> It's a wonderful thing. I never thought Shelly would be involved because she had her own business. Uh, but she got tired of doing that and joined us. It's a wonderful thing. And uh, I guess now is a good time to mention that uh, Sally uh, organized a coup d'etat, right? <laughs> I begged her. <laughs> I begged her to kick me out of office. I, I tell you what, I am so fortunate to have Sally. She is, well, you met her. Mm-hmm. I, I know people don't see her on the radio but um she has just a a regal confidence but not arrogant yeah um she's so down to earth but extraordinarily intelligent you know chemistry and and business background and then all of her business experience as well yeah and um and i every woman i've ever met i hold to her standard when it's you know not very fair uh, right but uh, you know, I look at, I kind of compare them to my sister, and uh, and every woman that I've ever known who knows my sister, kind of tries to be her, not be her, but live up to her standard. And, right. 
And um, I know she probably wouldn't want me saying this stuff, but that's a fact. That's what it is. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. she she probably knows it, Andy. Right. I don't know. I don't know if she does. Right. I really don't. All right. Well, um, now she does. Well, well, I've told her myself, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. But I don't think she's internalized it. Got it, got yeah. it, got it. It hasn't yeah. hit. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so so New York, and, and you know, we don't want to go go through the whole thing again, but you do land in Denver, and just t- tell tell us about uh, high school Andy, and it's, ah. it seems like uh, Pete was, was always in the picture as far as Andy's concerned, so high school Pete, too, right? Yeah, high school Pete, too. Yeah, I was... Uh, I, I was. We were always a bit of loners because we moved so much in our lives. We, yeah. we just got used to, you know, being tight together. Yeah. And um, but high school was a little different. I did two years in one school. Uh huh. And uh, my sophomore and my senior year, and and you know those two aren't together, right? No, they're not together. I moved away <laughs> and came back. All right. My mom sent me away. She couldn't handle me anymore. <laughs> right. To me, go to your dad. <laughs> Where was he at the time? He was in Washington State. Oh, on, okay, on an island. Very little to do on an island as a oh yeah troubled kid. Yeah. No, it was wonderful. Oh it, okay, good. Yeah, I had a blast. I was born there, but uh, yeah, my dad had a, an iron hand. But that's another story. So, right. so very early in life, I um, had gotten sick of being teased. Uh, I've always been a big, big guy. I just the way I am. Mm-hmm. Um, they call me Bear for a reason. Right. And um, and so we we move schools so much, you know. Kids are are not very uh, friendly when it, when it comes to new kids, and so they would tease me. And I, I remember the very moment. I remember in vivid detail walking down the street, and I don't know what had just happened, but I remember the decision I made. I, I am never going to let anybody tease me again. Okay. And so I was way oversensitive to being teased, and and from that point on, as soon as I got teased. Uh, or somebody threatened my family, I would just hit them. I would, no warning, just bam. And it happened with a guy down the street, Robbie. I don't know if Robbie's listening, but sorry, Robbie. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, he had hit my brother in the back with a peach. He threw a, a, an unripe peach at my brother and caused a little trickle of blood to, oh, boy. to appear. Right. And I and then I just went and just wailed it. And um, his dad was a paramedic I recall right and he came marching up to my house and and my mom was dating a guy at the time who was there and, and then, you know they exchanged words that I didn't hear and and he came back in and patted me on the head and said good job and I just not what I expected so that kind of reinforced my attitude and I became a fighter ever from that time forward well so this surprises me because every time I see you mm-hmm. uh, the bear I see it right yeah. it's hard not to yeah but you got that big smile yeah right I, I don't, uh, I'm surprised to hear that uh, you were a fighter. I was a fighter, but I wasn't a bully. I was kind right. of an anti-bully. Got it. And uh, I, solved par- I solved problems. Yeah, yeah. I didn't like seeing other people being picked on right. and things like that. And Why did the father of the child that you hit say thank you or say good job? No, he didn't. The, my mom's boyfriend at the time who was living with us. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. thank you for clearing that up. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, he came up and. And had words with this guy Scott. Yeah. Was living there. Yeah. And he's like Andy did that, that. That was probably the right thing to do, type of thing. Yeah, right. yeah. So then uh, that translated through high school. Yeah. And um, I was very much a loner. I was a football player and good at that. Um, lineman, I would imagine. I was a lineman. Yeah. 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 And uh, but I didn't get along with the rest of the football team because they were the jocks, and I wasn't any good group. And and uh, so they would would commonly try to fight me because I had gotten a reputation uh-huh. and so they would all of a sudden the whole school would be following me and they're like oh someone's gonna try and fight me and um <laughs> we got another one coming <laughs> yeah yeah and so with this reputation uh you know pete came up behind yeah. and and so he's never hit a person in anger in his life okay and and because they i guess they, everyone knew that that uh, that i would come after them if they did right and but you know that's that's kind of how it went and he hung out with me um his nickname was Stinky. <laughs> uh, he that he hated. Oh, he hated that name. And um, so was, that, was that cannabis based or no? It was just being mean to Pete. Okay, you know? yeah. yeah, probably shouldn't have done it. But right. uh, and I don't think it was me who named him. I think one of my friends did. But yeah. but we had a group of guys that we hung out with, called ourselves the gang. Right. And um, and we did all kinds of drinking and partying. We had a group of girls and guys. And, would all you know 
party together constantly. And we had places down by the creek where we'd go and go skinny dipping and all that stuff. We were, we were just not very good kids. And, um, and Pete would come to some of the events. I would shelter him from some, but he would come with us at other times. And, and he's just kind of a, the tag along. And he had his own friends, but he tagged along any time he could. And, um, and everyone loved him. Got and it. Everyone always loves Pete. The way he, he bounces when he walks, like Tigger. And, <laughs> yeah. That's not bad. No, we had fun. It was, <laughs> we had a fun childhood. But, you know, that's the time that I started getting a little out of control with my mom. Said you can either go to detention or you can go to your dad. You pick, right? Yeah. And you did spend a year with dad. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah. So we didn't talk much about him with Sally. So mm-hmm. give us the overview there. So my dad and mom married. Uh, my dad's an Annapolis graduate, yeah, uh, naval officer, and um, you know, very much, uh, very conservative guy, very old fashioned, and um, and you know, not, didn't really match with my mom's personality. You know, she. She didn't buy into the, you know, bow down to your, your husband, do what he says. Be, you know, you know, like my mom tells me a story that would irritate her when they were married, that he would stand by the door on, on Sunday because we'd go to church, and um, and he would say, you know, be at the door at 6 a.m. or whatever to her and have the kids ready. Right. And, and so she'd be busying about getting us ready, and he would stand at the door, look at his watch, and tap his foot. And if he, she didn't get there in time, he would leave. And so, um, you know, that didn't go over well with her. And then, and then he did three tours in Vietnam, so he was away a lot. And, uh, and they ended up getting divorced. But, you know, I think that's probably for the better. Uh, they would've, it would have happened sooner or later, just yeah. knowing both of them. Um, but, you know, we had so much fun with my dad. I, and we'd go there every summer. My mom would send us. It was part of the divorce agreement. And right. we'd go out. Uh, live with my dad for you know, four to six weeks in the summertime, and and he had four kids of his own um, with another woman, you know, one of which was his, but you know they they were all his kids, but uh, one biologically, and so we had eight kids out there. Oh man, yeah, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was hectic. Eight kids in a house. I felt so sorry for my stepmother Barbara. Right, love her to death. She's very much like a mother to me, and and um, oh my gosh, what times we would have there as a whole clan, you know, four boys, four girls, you know, it's just what a great time. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, Sally did, uh, take us through the fact that you didn't have enough money. You said you didn't have enough money. I don't hear that at all. You know, as far as, you know, you say I had a great childhood. I had so much fun. There were eight kids there. I was having fun there, having fun Mm -hmm. in high school. So, uh, it's amazing that that didn't affect you, uh, in real time, I guess. Right. Yeah, I don't, you know, we knew we didn't have money. That was obvious. Yeah. We didn't, we never focused on it. I mean, I would feel bad for costing my mom money for this or that. You did mention that, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, I appreciated things a lot. Like, I remember I wanted to play the trumpet. This is almost the time where she met Richard, which, you know, really improved our lives. And, um, and, but I wanted to play the trumpet. And she was working at this, Com care is what it was called in the name, and she would help place nurses in in homes uh, for for people. And mm-hmm. Very low paying job. She took the bus to work every day, and we. I remember Pete and I would go greet her at the bus every day when she got home. And, and I want to play a trumpet, and it was really expensive. You know, it's two hundred fifty dollars for a used trumpet or something. I recall it's two hundred forty nine dollars. I remember the tag, and and I didn't I didn't want to ask her for it. I was like I'm not going to ask her for this. That's a ton of money. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And she got it for me and I, she put it on payments I think is right. what happened. And oh did I love that trumpet right. and um, really treasured it because of her getting it for me, making the sacrifice. So then I felt very compelled to learn how to play it. <laughs> and then I remember I was standing at a bus stop one day. Yeah. And what was his name? Louis Armstrong. Brett. Oh. Brett decided to play a trick on me and open my trumpet while I was standing there, and the trumpet fell out and it was dented. Oh. And then my fighter came out. Boy, did I wail him! Right. Oh, he'd made a mistake. Right, because he basically just dented your mother. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So we knew we didn't have money, and um, but boy, did we have love in the house. Yeah. And um, you know, we had each other, and and we were always, you know, that started our entrepreneurship. Quite honestly, I remember even as young as. You know, seven years old, maybe eight. I'd go mow lawns. So we had this push mower, you know, the kind you push, and it 
in terms of rotary blade that mm -hmm. uh, that you know is there and and as soon as I had enough strength to push that thing I'd, I'd go out looking for work and I remember we got a power mower from somebody somebody gave us a power mower and you had to wrap a rope around this this, this cylinder to pull it to start it and as soon as I had enough strength to that I, cause I would always try and try finally had enough strength to do it but then I made the business decision not to use the power mower because I figured people would see me working harder with a push mower and pay me more which was a bad idea you know one of my first business decisions went wrong um, but <laughs> that's a that's a great example of working harder not smarter that's right yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah and uh, but we did it throughout our lives you know, sn you know shoveling snow you know sisters babysitting doing paper routes right any way we could make money we would do it let's follow that uh, string here so yeah. we've got uh, mowing lawns we've got shoveling snow we've got paper routes babysitting whatever yeah. keep going what what was the next uh, the next entrepreneurial type of uh, the next entrepreneurial thing, I always, even in high school, I knew I wanted to start a business. Right. And I was at least a little bit smart enough to know that I didn't have enough life experience at the time. And um, so after high school, I was also smart enough to know that I was really bad at school at the time. I wasn't, I wasn't disciplined enough. And uh, while I had some scholarships to go to colleges for football, I, I knew I would fail because I just, I knew I didn't have the discipline. And I was dating a girl um, that I think I wanted to get I want to get away from, but I didn't want to break up with her for some reason. I don't know why. And so I thought I could either work at McDonald's or continue my construction job that I'm doing right now, or I can go in the army. So actually I called my dad and I said, dad, I'm, I'm going to go in the military and uh, which branch should I choose? Right. And I kind of laid out some of the options because there's different benefits for doing this. And uh, I said, should I go in the Navy? Mm -hmm. and, he, and he said, are you going to go as an officer? And I said, no. He said, well, don't go in the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Yeah, Jack, Jack. right, yeah. <laughs> so then I made the decision. I went in the Army. And, uh, and again, just another good decision. Oh, here's a fun story. So my mom is not about confrontation. And so there's been, you know, very few times in my life where she's really sat me down and just beat me over the head with something. And um, Physically? No, uh, no, no, no. Emotionally. Yeah, emotionally. And... <laughs> And I had, you know, this is my sophomore year, which is kind of my troubled year growing up. And, and I quit the football team. And, um, and, and because I was having, you know, the, I just beat up the quarterback because he picked a fight with me. Right, as you said. Yeah, and, and his dad was a head coach. Oh, boy. And that didn't go over well. Not so well. And so it was a little bit difficult and uncomfortable practice, and, and I quit. I think that was a reason, thinking back on it. I don't think that's the reason I gave my mom. But, um, And so she sat me down. She was so disappointed in me. And and she said, Andy, you're a quitter. And you're always going to be a quitter unless you change it. Oh, wow. And and that stuck. Really hit hit home. Right. And she didn't even remember doing it. And, um, it's and visceral so, for her. That's Yeah. 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 <laughs> And, and so here I am in the Army. I just went through a day of, you know, the, the recruiter come and pick me up at my house at 4.30. We go to the station. They, you know, put you all through the indoctrination and send you off, ride a bus with full of drill sergeants to your place you're going to be, and you get off. And so then they march around. It's like midnight or 2 in the morning or something. I don't know. We just got done marching all over the place. I'm dead tired. And and all these people are yelling at me. And, and the drill sergeant says, they were all lined up at attention. He said, Any of you pansies want to go home to your mama? <laughs> Take one step forward right now and I'll make that happen. And I remember thinking, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I might take a step yeah, right that's now. That's <laughs> right. And then my mom's voice came in, you know, you're a quitter. And and uh, I said, I'm not going to quit. <laughs> well, because I can't go home to my mama. No, that's. No, no. <laughs> And so that lesson has always stayed with me. Amazing. How long were you in the service? I was in for three years. I had a wonderful time as a cavalry scout. Went to commando school in France, which is really French Foreign Legionnaire training. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And um, I just had the best time, you know. Why'd you get out then? Uh, I looked at my... my, my so I was enlisted, mm -hmm. and I, I looked at the NCOs that uh, were leading me and uh, they didn't look a, a day over 50 and yet there were 35. Aha. Uh -huh. And, um, and you know, 
being enlisted is, is not an easy life. I had a wonderful time. I met great friends. Um, but it takes a toll on the body. And, and at the time, you know, this is in the mid and late 80s, um, you know, we were scaling back and everything and mm. getting promotions was difficult. I can mm. go on and on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just a lot more opportunity out of the military at the time. Got it. And did you go back to Colorado? Went back to Colorado. Right. Stayed with my mom for a couple months while I found a job and got on my feet. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, became a security guard is what I did. <laughs> the bear becomes a guard. Yeah, I was a guard. <laughs> and I did that for quite a while until I met a girl who made me stop smoking because I picked that up in the Army. Right. And, and uh, we're, we're speaking of uh, cigarettes at this time. That's right. right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and she was to become my, my first ex-wife. Uh-huh. Um, Is there more than one ex-wife? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have kids with the first one. I'm glad because... Having kids with Satan would have been horrible. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's how that went. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, But anyway, she did get me to quit smoking. I can say that. Good it's thing a, about her. A benefit, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but she had high ambition, and, and uh, she wanted me to have high ambition. So I just wanted to please her. So I went to college. And, uh, again, this is all dumb luck. I, I have dumb luck into so many things. Right. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, and... I was at college in Pueblo, Colorado, at the University of Southern Colorado. Mm -hmm. And um, I was walking around the engineering department, looking at all the cool things that they had displayed all over the place, and just passing time, waiting for my next class, whatever it was. And I walked past this office, and there's this beautiful woman sitting in there. Her name was Dr. Mills. Mm -hmm. And she was the temporary dean or whatever of uh, the engineering department. And I thought, well, I'll go talk to her. Well, there's and, cool sh stuff on the walls yeah, here, and, and there's a pretty lady yeah, in there. Yeah, And so I went in, and I asked her about the engineering department. I thought of nothing else. I could just sit here and talk to her for a while. Right. And um, and so she talked me into taking a class with her, um, you know, the introduction to industrial engineering. And I thought, how bad could this be? I get an elective. I get to look at her every day. And that sounds pretty good. I'll do it. And uh, Sign me up. So that's how I became an industrial engineer. <laughs> Just like that. Just like that. Yeah. All right. And, uh, you know, I, I want to kind of fast forward because I want to get to the kernels, if you will, of, of sure. Medicine Man. Okay. So right? during college, yeah. um, I, I uh, started a, a company to make money. You know, instead of getting a job, I started a fencing company. Okay. And uh, meaning, with, with swords? No, building fences. My, uh -huh. my brother's the swords. I'm the building. The Got fence. it. Yeah. Um, and so I, I had never built a fence before, and I built one for myself. And I thought, well, that was easy. And because I did some research, figured out how to do it. And I said, let me. So I made some flyers, and I wanted to see if I could get some work. And I passed them around in neighborhoods needing fences. And um, and sure enough, I got calls. And so I built my first fence. Chain and, link? or No, it was a wooden fence. Okay. And, didn't know how to build a gate at the time. I became a gate master later. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I made money. I was like, oh, that was great. Yeah. And it was good work, you know. Uh, it made me feel good. And so I, I started building fences. And I became the best fence builder that I know. Uh -huh. And um, and I did that throughout college. Um, and uh, then I graduated with that as life went on to doing decks. I got to be very good at building decks. And, right. And uh, then I went into basement remodels as well. Okay. And so, so graduating each time to something a little bit more difficult, a yeah, little bit more difficult, right? Which is really more like, I don't have any work. I need to do something more to get some more jobs. You know what I could do is basements. Yes, I can do that. I know I can. I'm a general contractor. <laughs> Come on. I'm a GC. <laughs> that's right. And that's how I went. You know, that's how I did it. And, and, um, and so as soon as I would learn that I wasn't making a living wage um, in anything like that, I would, I would get a job right. as an engineer right. and always in manufacturing. So my first job in manufacturing was with a company called ABC Rail, no longer in business. I think they were purchased by Progressive Rail or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and this company built um, custom rail for the for the um, railroads and you know turnouts. Mm -hmm. Everything involved in a turnout, which is switches and guard rail and stock rail and frogs and plates and all kinds of stuff. And, and uh, so anytime a train crosses over another track. Um, they get involved. Yeah, it's a whole turnout there. <laughs> right. And and so we would prefab them as well in the yard and ship them out on the yards. And it was a union company, and this is down in Pueblo. And so, um, you know, very mafia, mafia town, and, and everybody in that shop had a 
last name that ended in a vowel. Mm -hmm. And they're very nice. They're great people. Sure. Um, Good food. Yeah, there was a bookie yeah. in the in the shop. Got it. Yep. And uh, but I was management. I was not. I was not union. And but they treated me well. They were very nice. But I I got a baptism in union labor at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very interesting and and extremely rewarding work. I learned a lot. I had a good mentor there, Ron Lancaster, who was my engineering manager and learned a lot. Um, and then, so I'm continuing my side work as yeah. this is going on. And then I get a job at an aviation company called Jefferson. And here in town, they're a world leader in, in um, aviation information. Got it. And, uh, Brought your industrial uh, engineering to them. That's, That's right. right. And, and so did a lot of industrial engineering, worked with one of my best friends, Brad Decker, who's Probably the best industrial engineer I know, and um, learned a lot working with him. Mm -hmm. Also got into quality there, and so became a, a quality engineer, you might say, and um, learned a lot about ISO 9000. Sure, did all kinds of stuff with that. Yeah, and they're up to ISO 14,000 now, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, I stopped learning that, thank God, <laughs> before that. These yeah. are manufacturing standards for. That's right. Yeah, but anyway. Yeah, and. So then I, again, followed Brad Decker to um, uh, Sun Microsystems, uh -huh. and, and I used my quality learning there, mm -hmm. and, my, and my industrial engineering, and, and um, I ended up building, um, I was a project manager on building what they called their uh, uh, mission control, and, and it's where we monitored our, our internal processes and systems and our, and our, our customers' external systems, and and would escalate things um, through different levels of, of help, depending on if they're a 911 center and whatever, you know, there's just different things. But I built it, and I had a British boss at the time. He told me to build a demonstrably impressive showcase that is also functional for the customer. And, uh, and so we built this Star Wars room that was just fun, and I got to run it. And, and so that was where 9-11 hit, uh, and I remember that day so well. Uh, I was ironing a shirt watching TV when that second plane hit and, mm. and I knew I had to get into work because a lot of our customers would be affected and and uh, me and a good friend who worked for me, Ariel Barreto, um, ran the mission control and organized really the recovery of our, our uh, customers the best we could. We had ships of, of um, product and you know just computers and everything going across the country because they, they lost their offices so we set up offices and did all kinds of stuff. What a crazy time that yeah. was. Yeah. But then Sun got hit really hard by that um, and ended up, you know, a couple years later, whatever, going through a lot of layoffs. And so I was laid off from Sun. And again, first thing I did was start another business. Mm -hmm. And um, the other one had sunsetted, so you had to start yeah, something. Yeah, because I got too busy with my job. So right. I really just picked that up again. Got it. And uh, spent my savings mm -hmm. and then had to get another job. Right. Okay. And uh, so I think one of my problems back then was I couldn't find someone to work for me that did a good job. So I would get work and then I'd do it and then I'd be out of work and I'd have to get work. Right. And I never got the idea of trying to, I got the idea. I just couldn't figure out how to do it. Got it. Of expansion and, and getting good employees. And, and um, so then I worked for a company called Electronic Warfare Associates. Um, What's that? I, yeah, that was a lot of fun. So that my dad uh, helped me get this job. He was uh, vice president. So mm -hmm. my dad uh, in the Navy was an electronic warfare um, professional. He, he was in an EA-6B Prowler, which at the time was the Navy and, and, and uh, Marine electronic warfare craft, warfare aircraft. So right. They would fly in with the, the fighters. And in electronic warfare will jam enemy radar. They'll put phantoms up on the screen. They'll do all kinds of stuff to help conceal and to confuse the enemy so that they don't kill our guys. Right. Sure. And and um, and so he was in a private uh, company now, and he was a, a high-ranking uh, officer in the company. And so he got me a job out here as a quality engineer contract with with uh, the local office who were building these simulators for. The military and so I worked there as a contractor worked my way into a full time position as a manufacturing manager um, and then from there I got promoted to um, really it was program manager but mm. you know it was, it was I was in charge of the whole office all the people reported to me mm -hmm. and um, and I just ran the program so my job really was to organize things and and get things out of the way for all these smart people doing all the work got it. and uh, it was Probably the best job I had ever had 
uh, well, was the best job I ever had up to that time. Mm-hmm. That moved to New Jersey. So again, I started a business. And uh, So they moved away from you, so okay, I'll start something Yeah, else. They, they wanted me to go uh, to New Jersey with them, but um, and I went out there and tried really hard to like New Jersey. Yeah, it's tough. Um, but, you know, coming from Colorado, it's just different. Right. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so I didn't want to go. Stayed here because I could start a business, right? I don't need anybody. There we go. And uh, so soon failed at that. And, and this is the second time in my life now. The first time was earlier, right after Sun. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I remember this. It was the worst feeling. I you know, now have a daughter. Uh, my daughter was born in, in uh, two. So now I have my second mm-hmm. ex-wife married to Right. The there team. we go. One, yeah. two. Fair yeah. enough. But now I have a kid. Yeah. Got the kid. Yeah. And I remember. <laughs> you don't smoke cigarettes and yeah. you have a kid. The, yep, these are the kid. things that we take from marriage. That's for, right. From Andy Williams. Yeah. But now I'm drinking way too much probably. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's a different story. That's a different story. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, I remember going to the store and and buying groceries is what I could, and uh, and thinking, okay, now I'm really broke. I I don't have pennies to rub together, mm-hmm. and I don't know where I'm going to buy groceries next week. And I had been submitting resumes all over the place, trying to get work everywhere I could. Nothing was hitting, and um, and it was the lowest time in my life. I I never felt lower as a man not being able to take care of my family. It, it was just the worst feeling. Oh, I don't wish that upon anybody. And and then I think the next day I got a call from Jefferson again. And, and my old boss said, hey, I think I have a position for you. Right. And um, boy, did I run in there. <laughs> I've never been so nervous in an interview. I, you know, up to that point had been pretty confident in interviews. And, right. and but I had had a string of just Oh, you know, we really liked you. You came in second place mm. in responses. Right. And um, so I, sh- I, was, I had been sporting a beard up to that point. I said, you know what? I'm going to shave my beard off. Maybe this is making me, you know, look too much like a bear in yeah. these things. And, right. And I don't know if that did it or not because I didn't interview with my friend. I interviewed with other people that didn't know me. Right. And uh, But I came through on that one and got a job in the nick of time um, at Jefferson again. And, I, and I, so I became a project manager for them I ended up getting a certification for a project management professional through um, the uh, project management institute the PMI mm-hmm. and so I became a PMP is what it's called yeah. and um, then I became a program manager there and then I ended up working my way because I saw a need for it uh, a friend and I he's my dearest friend uh, now Kurt Waltrip um, and he and I saw a need for uh, project portfolio management at the company and so we we launched that. We sold management on you know senior management on the need for it, and so I created a position for myself there. There we go. A project management professional and uh, and and in portfolio management. So, uh, and if if you don't know what portfolio management is for projects, you it's really teeing up projects to be executed. So mm-hmm. it's deciding what to do um, the the following year, or for us it was the following year, right? Um, based on the goals of the company. Um, and really getting information to the decision makers, letting them pick the projects. Once the projects are picked, um, picking the projects team, helping them get funded, and then making sure that they're executed properly right. as they're going through. So, so you're becoming a manager. You're becoming yeah. a, a, you know, I can get things done. I can move people. I can That's move right. projects. Yeah, and trying to have influence without without authority because, you know, no one reported to me necessarily, but you, you have to influence people. Right. So learning that. And, of course, then my brother, on the other hand, was – was uh, being a caregiver out of his basement, and, right? You know, making over a hundred thousand dollars a year as a hobby, uh huh, and um, and having a fun time inventing all of this cool stuff. Right. Yeah, I remember going over there one time and helping him. He had determined that he needed a cooler for his water, but he didn't want to go buy a, a normal chiller for water. He and so instead he pounded a hole through his basement floor and dug a big hole. Oh sure. And, and so. Uh, and that he could put his water down into to keep it a nice constant temperature for free. And uh, and so I was over there one night helping him dig this hole right. with the hardest earth. I'm a good, I'm a PhD, a post hole digger. And uh, and that was one of the hardest holes I've ever had to dig. I'm a PhD. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So you do. So this is now a project with uh, Pete. You, yeah. you, you're a PhD. You yep. dig the hole. You yep. get it in. When does cannabis as a business, he's he's a caretaker. Yeah. When does Andy kind of get involved here? All right. So I had worked my 
my longest I'd ever worked for a company, over three years. Right. And I am having itchy feet. Boy, right. I'm look, and I'm always, my brain is always looking for business opportunities. And October 2009, uh, the Justice Department comes out and says that they're not going to use their resources to go after people following state laws when it comes to marijuana. And bing, a light bulb goes off in my head. And I go to Pete and I say, hey, you know, he had just gotten divorced, so he really didn't have his kids are older now. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, uh, how about we go big with this? And, uh, he, and he was just, okay, you know. <laughs> and uh, he was all for it. And so I put together a business plan, mm -hmm. and um, then we had to get money. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, we went to two people for money, my mom and my dad, because my dad. So well, you went to me. Sally first, right? Yeah, we went to Sally, because that we, mom didn't even know that Pete uh, smoked marijuana. So right. that was going to be a harder sell, we thought. Right. And, and Sally had been successful in real estate and, and other business ventures that she had done. And we thought, well, Sally's going to want to get into this. Sure. Yeah, but it's just obvious, right? Because we're going we're gonna to succeed. <laughs> and um, so we take the business plan, Sally, show it to her. And, and uh, you know, she, she was nice about it. I don't think she, she crushed us or anything, but uh, her answer was no. Yeah. But now I know what was going on in her head. Right. I'm not giving you guys deadly. <laughs> this is your fifth business, and none of them have worked. Sally and I had started a business. Oh, did she tell you that? No, she did not. Yeah, Sally ah. and I started a business together that failed once. Interesting. Yeah, it was called American Graffiti, and we had a kiosk. Wait, wait I saw that movie. That's not you guys. That's not us. Right. No. Yeah. They took our name. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so, so it was called American Graffiti. We had a kiosk at a mall in in Colorado Springs, and it was a we just sold anything with the American flag on it, and. We thought, you know, military town, it's pretty good. And uh, no, we didn't do well. Uh, we did lose money, you know, except maybe a few thousand dollars or whatever. But yeah. uh, so we made enough money to kind of break even. But I worked for free. And, but I got to sit, hang out in the mall all day and, and visit with people. So I had a really good time. Right. Um, but anyway, that's beside the point. But so Sally had seen us all fail miserably with businesses and she was about to, to lend us money. So next stop, um, I think it was my dad next. Yeah. And so I was taking a trip out to, I was taking a trip out to uh, DC to see him. And I had my business plan with me. And, and I got to tell you, I, you know, I remember a time in my life where my dad, I was at his house living with him in the summer. And one of the sailors that was in his command smoked marijuana. Right. And he came home. He was at home when he learned, they called him up and we had to answer the phone. Uh, William's family, Andy speaking, how may I help you? And so I give the phone to my dad and uh, and he goes ballistic and starts cussing. My dad never cussed. Right. And he cussed, which made a big impression on me. And and uh, and then he told the guy on the phone how he's going to throw this guy in a brig and give him a captain's mast and all this stuff. And, and uh, I was like, wow, marijuana's bad. <laughs> and so that was the impression of marijuana I had with my dad. Right. And so here I am going to him with this business plan, and I love my dad for it. He took it really well, and uh, and and he doesn't have a lot of. He has his retirement, you know, right? And, and and he was going to put money in. God bless him. And I'm so glad he didn't, because I would have been so nervous about that money, because he couldn't afford to lose it. And uh, so I kind of left him as kind of stewing on it. Yeah. And I knew we were, you know. I don't know what it is. I have this self pressure that I want to get things done very quickly. Yeah. And and so I went. And, um, and I had this need to, to get funding. So I went to my mom and Pete and I laid it out. First we had to say one, Pete smokes marijuana. And so that was a shock. Right. Shock number two, by the way, he grows in his house. You go there all the time, it reeks of marijuana and yet you don't know somehow right. that he grows marijuana in his house. Um, but that's, let's break that to you as yeah. well. Okay, those two shocks are over. Now we wanna go into business with marijuana, which by the way, you've never tried and probably think it's evil right? because of all the programming that's been done for a couple of decades. Yeah. And uh, so we lay out the plan in front of her and, and her husband and um, because my mom had married a, a very wealthy man and was very blessed for that and he's a great guy. Good. And uh, and so, you know, they had to think about it as well but not too long and, and somehow she got over all of these shocks that she had to do and say yes to us. Uh-huh. And uh, so we still have a picture of the first check being given to us. Uh, Lou gave it to us, her husband, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know how he did it. 
But now we have 150 grand, and we are excited because we're super rich. Right. Sure. Super rich. This is a ton of ton money. Ton of money. Yeah. We're gonna hire, you know, a marketing firm here pretty soon. Right. Sure. Yeah. And uh, but away we go. So December eighth, two thousand nine, we formed Medicine Man. There you go. And uh, and so it was a slow build over time, and and we had to go back to mom for more money quite a few times. And mom just a little bit more. Yeah. We're gonna make it. And we ended up. Uh, needing six hundred thirty thousand dollars before we were able to turn the corner and not not need more. And and you know Sally kind of brought us through from where you just brought us, yeah. uh, you know, kind of all the way forward. Yeah. But um, you know, just kind of the final few things I want to talk about is luck. Let's return to that theme yeah. of luck because the the building that you found, yeah, zoned appropriately mm -hmm. and near the airport. Yeah, it didn't feel like luck at the time, but it turned out that way, right? Right. So when we first started, we were like, okay, we had a list of things we wanted in an industrial space. And, um, you know, we want 2,000 amps, which we thought was a lot at the time. Sure. Um, turns out not to be. Um, you know, we had all these requests. and But instead, what we got is doors slammed in our face. Sure. Nobody wanted us as a tenant. Right. And so somehow we found this building who which is owned by a prominent Republican uh, in the state, who I won't name, uh, or was owned at the time, Yeah. And uh, but very libertarian on this issue. Sure. And he happened to have a spice company next door, and, and nobody wanted to lease the, so there's 40,000 square foot building, 20,000 leased, the other 20,000 square feet had been empty for five years or something, yeah. and so nobody wanted to lease it because they were so stinky. Right. And for us, we're like, yeah, this is great. You Absolutely. Know? And, well, Pete uh, will take it. That's his nickname. That's right, Stinky Pete. <laughs> um, don't tell him I told you that. Um, so anyway, we get it, and then we get a smoking deal. We get a, So normally, uh, warehouse space at time was about 6 or $7 a square foot yeah. plus cam, um, triple net. And and so we got it a dollar a square foot triple net for the first year, which is almost like pretty much free. Yeah. And, uh, and it went up very slightly over time. The guy just wanted to make a little bit of money off of it. Right. And uh, so we fell into that. And then, so we just wanted to be cultivators when we started. And then, and then Colorado said, nope, you have to also sell it. Yeah. And you have to sell everything you grow pretty much, right? That's it. Or 70% of it anyway. And so now we didn't have money to go somewhere else for a retail uh, outlet. So we had to open up one right there. And, and again, we lucked out because the way it was zoned, we were able to have a 3,000 square foot um, grow, or not a grow, but a, a retail outlet right. in front of this building, yeah. which doesn't always happen yeah. in, in industrial space. And, um, and people would come to me and say, Andy, how are you going to get people here? Because yeah. we're kind of off the make beaten path. And I had never been a good marketer. I I, I didn't want to be a retailer, never done retail. Right. And I was like, oh, I don't, I'm going to do it. It's going to, people are going to come here. You'll see. You'll see. In my head, I was not confident whatsoever. I tried to put as much confidence as I could in that. Yeah. But uh, we were able to do it. And uh, It's an amazing story, and we didn't even talk about anything. And so uh, I'm coming to, to Denver, and we're okay. going to sit down again, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. All right. I have a lot more stories. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, we got to talk about the rest of it. You know, yeah. Sally gave us a kind of uh, an overview. Pete will give us the rest, and we'll, yeah. we'll talk to you again. I want to ask you two final questions, though. Sure. And the first one is, uh, what have you most learned or what has most surprised you in cannabis? And then the second question is almost the same. What has most surprised you in life? Life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what okay. has most surprised you in cannabis? You guys are in for a long time. Yeah. You know, I came into this as, uh, as an entrepreneur just thinking about the business of it. And, um, and... And over time, you know, I've got a deep appreciation for a lot of things. So, you know, one, there's a lot of people that that's came before us and, um, you know, did this illegally rather than at the time when we started, it was kind of gray. Mm -hmm. right? They were in the black market, we were in the gray market. Right. And, um, and it was scary as hell just being in the gray market. And, I mean, I would have dreams of, you know, coming to work and being raided and being taken to prison, never seeing my, my kids again. And, and some other scary times happened. And, um, and it wasn't easy. And, and I thought, wow, you know, we really are pioneers in this. This is, uh, 
something crazy, but I know there's a lot of pioneers that came before us that didn't have, you know, we didn't have a lot of protection, but we had a little protection right. in, in what we were doing. And they had none, and they would go to jail for their whole life for doing what I did. Right. And did go to jail for their whole life. Right. So, you know, having the respect for that, and but then also seeing the medicinal effect of marijuana. When I went in, I thought it was a crock. I thought, no, these people are just saying that. Whatever. Yeah. And But when you're there and people come into your store every day and they grab you by the elbow and say, I need to talk to you. And they tell you their story. They give you their testimony in whatever way it's helping them or their family. Hmm. And they go to tears a lot of times. And, and they thank you for what you're doing. You know, I'm just, I'm, you know, thank you for thanking me, but uh, yeah. you know, you know, I don't think I deserve that thanks. But uh uh, it's, it's, it's it's the medicine. I'm only the medicine man. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, seeing that on a daily basis is very you know, you know, life-changing. You just and When I speak to legislators now and they have that same condescending voice with me, yeah. not believing what I'm saying, I, it drives me nuts. Right. And um, But anyway, yeah. uh, those two things really surprised me and how I would change uh, in the marijuana industry. Right. And um, really appreciating what it is and what it's used for and then, you know don't get me wrong i love the recreational side too sure uh, of course it's wonderful but, yep and life yeah is, uh, life what's most surprised you you know i don't know if it was really surprised but i one of the things i've learned i guess that uh that's uh, certainly true when you hear it you know you say showing up is half the battle well you know i think it's 70 percent of it or more um and and I don't know. That people always say, you know, how do you do that? How do you start a business? How do you do that? And it's just not being afraid to fail. And when you fail, it's it's uh, moving forward. People hear that all the time. But boy, it's a case. And 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 I think I'm blessed with these goggles that don't allow me to see the downside very well, uh, or the complexity about what I'm about to get into. And the, and the fact is that when you're in it and you're taking one step at a time, it doesn't seem that bad. But if you're looking at the whole thing, the whole elephant, and and, and uh, trying to eat it with one bite, it's, it's daunting, you never jump in. So um, I'm blessed with, with you know, nearsightedness and, and blinders that don't allow me to see um, pitfalls in, in my path. Mm. And, and, um, and being able to react to those and, and move forward, um, can get you pretty far. I, I don't know. I just, I, I really is just showing up and trying is the is the biggest thing in life, and not being afraid to fail, and and uh, and just giving it your all and the positive attitude. You got it. And yeah. and uh, Sally uh, kind of added, and you added here. Yeah. You know, kind of add a little bit of luck. Oh, lots of luck. Yeah. Right. With with the hard work. Yeah. And and you can get there. Amen to that. Yeah, we were very fortunate. This is one of those times that. Do you want a quick story about our business almost failed? Let's go. Okay. Uh, very first crop. My brother had been growing in his house in preparation for us getting licensed and ready to move in. Yeah. Well, you know, we got took a little bit longer, so my brother had this forest in his house, all over his house. <laughs> and uh, and so we got our license, and we got trucks and moved all these plants. And so now my, my cousin had thrown up sticks and plastic, and we have a structure in there, and we're growing our first crop. And uh, so I'm working another job, I'm working at Jefferson still. And so I have two jobs. I work there in the day, and then I come at night and work at, at Medicine Man. I'm, I'm Pete's helper right. when it comes to growing. Right. And so is Frank. And so I, I get a call at work, and Pete says, Andy, I think this whole crop is going to die. And, you know, all right, so I'm thinking, all right, my mom's money is down the tube. And, blah, blah, blah. and you know, I'm puckering big time at work. And... Uh, and I said, what can we do? And he, so they have root rot. So going from a basement to an industrial space is a big deal right. that we didn't realize. You can't for, just do that. Yeah. Right. And so we used Pete's techniques for his basement in an industrial space that wasn't controlled and, and the water was too warm and we have root rot. And, uh, and I said, well, what can we do? He said, well, we could transplant them into soil and try and clean them up. And I said, okay, let's do it. So all night we worked taking all these plants and we had a peroxide bath we take them out of the medium they were in, clean off the medium, which is like these little lava rocks, uh -huh. and um, and scrape off all the rotted roots and you know dip them in this peroxide, 
hopefully, and then plant them in soil. And we get through it all night. And uh, I don't know how the hell it happened, but these this crop survived. Far from optimal, right. but it was enough to keep us going. And and um, you know that was the very first time that we we avoided going out of business. Look at that. Pretty luckily, I think. All right. So again, I'm I'm coming yeah. to Denver. We got to do part two because right. you know there's so much to talk about. We just yeah. that was just the the tip of the Same iceberg, yeah. right? Yep. Thank you so much, Andy. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Seth. I really enjoyed it. All right. Big Bear Andy Williams. What a good guy. He just, uh, you know, he's got that big smile and he makes you makes you like him in person. Uh, hope that comes through on, uh, on this thing. Uh, again, hope you're enjoying it. Please do spread the word uh, about what we're doing here. We are, you know, in real time having a, a documentation of the oral history of legal cannabis.